Here's what's going on this week at ALCF. In our upcoming singles testimonial event, Glenn and Kelly Pazine will share their testimony of how they met, dated, and married, including the challenges they faced, along with insights from valuable lessons they've learned. This event takes place on Friday, September 13th, from 7 to 9 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Make plans to attend the Fall Women's Bible Study, where Beth Anderson, Tiffany Miller, Megan Easterhouse, and Corey Loritz will introduce you to the fruit of the Spirit, nine key attributes of people living lives aligned with the Holy Spirit as described in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The event takes place on Wednesdays starting September 25th through November 13th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Mom's Time Out is a great opportunity for mothers to relax, refresh, and refuel. Our theme this year is Fear Not, Learning to Rest in God's Love. And you can join other moms in the ALCF community on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month starting September 26th from 10 a.m. to noon in the Fellowship Hall. And child care is available with pre-registration. If you're 18 to 30-ish and looking to go deeper in your walk with a community of young adult believers, come hang out with our Young Adults Group for a fun-filled evening of games, events, speakers, group discussions, and more. This event takes place on Friday, September 13th and 27th from 7 to 9 p.m. in Allies 2. Get ready for a great afternoon of fellowship, fun, food, and games at the annual ALCF Picnic. This event takes place on Sunday, September 22nd from 12 to 4 p.m. at Rankstorf Park in Mountain View. Please sign up to bring a dish and to help us out at alcf.net slash signups. To sign up for any of these upcoming events, go to alcf.net slash signups or check out the ALCF app. And remember, abundant life exists to make a better you for a better world. So Father, we need you to speak to us today as we now come to your word. You have not promised to bless my words, but you have promised to bless the word. And so Father God, I stand as your instrument today, and I pray that you would speak to the hearts and lives of these, your people, that we would be encouraged, we would be inspired, we would be challenged, but ultimately we would be changed. So, Father God, as um, the old preachers used to say, would you stand in my body? Would you think with my mind? Would you speak with my tongue those things you'd have us know, say, and do? And Holy Spirit, would you save someone's soul today? Would you add to your church today? And we'll be quick to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Two music stands. I don't know if I've ever done this before. Hopefully that means a double anointing. I don't know. If you have your Bibles, meet me in Acts chapter 13. I'll tell you why we're not in the Sermon on the Mount in just a little bit. But we are in Acts chapter 13 this morning. Uh, As you're turning there, were any ladies encouraged yesterday at our women's conference? I want to... Uh, thank Sister Diane Bridges for her hard work and the team and all that they did to put that together. Amazing. Uh, I gave my mama specific instructions not to tell any stories about me, and I trust she was obedient uh, on that. But no, no, no. Hopefully she didn't give up too much dirt uh, as it relates to me. Also, were any brothers encouraged yesterday at the men's huddle? We had a good time yesterday at the men's huddle. If you missed out on yesterday, not too late, just jump in with us. Uh, We're going to meet for five more Saturdays from 8.30 to 10 a.m. right here in the Fellowship Hall. We're looking at a man and his marriage. Uh, There were a lot of single guys there yesterday, right on. Uh, You want to get a running start and just a good picture of what uh, what marriage is about. So I want to encourage you, come on out, bring a friend. It's a great time, and then you'll meet other men, and you'll be able to just share authentically what's going on in your lives and be able to encourage one another as well. Also want to encourage you on Tuesdays, uh, meet me for our Foundations Bible study from 7 to 8 upstairs. That is an enriching time as we're walking through the Word of God. This week we're going to study on the thing that makes God different and superior to every other thing in life. So please don't miss out on that. Acts chapter 13, pick me up in verse 1. The guy who writes this is Luke, and Luke says these words. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, 
Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, verse 3, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, I love this phrase, and sent them off, and sent them off. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Its presence is everywhere. You can't drive down the street more than a couple of blocks without running into one. It started many years ago from humble beginnings, and now it has expanded and exploded into a global force. Now, I ain't talking about the church. I'm talking about McDonald's. (laughs) You know the logo. It's a global logo that on site your kids go crazy. If you go to McDonald's website, here's what they say about themselves. Can you imagine a world without the Big Mac or Chicken McNuggets or Happy Meals? Luckily, back in 1954, a man named Ray Kroc discovered a small burger restaurant in California and wrote the first page of our history. And yet, if you've been tracking with McDonald's lately, you understand they've got some major PR problems. They have a huge image crisis. Don't know if you ever saw the documentary Super Size Me, in which an individual decides to just binge on McDonald's every day, every meal for 30 straight days, and then check in with a doctor along the way on cholesterol levels. Man, that hurt McDonald's big time. Because of that and uh, just more knowledge gained about diet and what's going on in the culture and so on and so forth, there have been many people who have either drastically slowed down their McDonald's intake or who have abandoned going to McDonald's altogether. Sadly, the Church of Jesus Christ has a lot in common with McDonald's. Driving down the street, you can't go for more than several blocks, especially if you're down south, without running into a church. Like McDonald's with its golden arches, we, we have a global lo- logo. It's called the cross. Upon seeing it, you immediately know that it's synonymous with Jesus Christ and the Christian faith. And yet, tragically, like McDonald's, we've got a major image problem. Immorality among leaders, hypocrisy among people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ but live lives antithetical to its message, division within the church, our image crisis has even come inside the church at all. It's time we get to the root of the problem. If you're new with us this morning, thanks for hanging out with us, and you picked a wonderful series. In a series called Impossibly Christian. We've been making our way through the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll pick it back up next week. But if you've been coming to Abundant Life with any regularity for a long period of time, you know that at least once or twice a year I come before you and give to you what's called our State of the Church Address. It's a time for me to just share what's on my heart, what we're believing God for. And again, if you're new, uh, this is a great Sunday for you to be here because I I just want to just pull you in and share some vision about what's happening and what we're believing God for at Abundant Life. I've chosen this morning to thread these vision points to a very important church in the Bible. In fact, uh, it's no stretch for me to go out on a limb and tell you this is probably the most important church in the Bible. It's not the church at Jerusalem. It's not the church at Ephesus. It's not the church at Rome. It's the church at Antioch. 
You need to get to know the church at Antioch because, again, it is the most influential church in the New Testament. The reason why we can say that is because our text tells us that Saul and Barnabas, uh, who were going to this church, are actually sent out, and they'll now go on three missionary journeys, and along the way, they'll plant churches right out of their sending church, Antioch. That's right, friends. If there is no church at Antioch, there's no church at Ephesus. If there is no church at Antioch, there's no church at Rome. If there is no church at Antioch, there's no church at Berea, Athens, Corinth, Thessalonica, you name it. The church at Antioch is an influential church that bears global influence. Abundant Life was started back in 1989. 34 people had split off from another church, and they called an individual by the name of Paul Shepard from the East Coast. He comes here. God breathes on their efforts, and next thing you know, six, 7,000 people are coming, and, and boy, I've had a front row seat to the global influence of abundant life that continues to reverberate today. Just this week, I was down in Santa Barbara lecturing at Westmont College, and after my evening lecture just a few days ago, uh, uh, an African-American woman came up to me, and she was, I looked you up, you, you pastor at Abundant Life? I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, uh, when I was a college student in the Bay Area, I, I went to Abundant Life, and at that church, I met Jesus, and I was built up in my faith, and now here I am. I'm a professor at UC Santa Barbara taking Jesus with me in the classroom. And I got to tell you, I do a lot of preaching and teaching nationally, and and at least six to seven out of ten times, I'll be shaking hands with individuals after preaching somewhere, and somebody will at least say to me on one of these events, hey, Abundant Life, I used to go there when I was doing my residency. I used to go there when I was in college. I used to go there when when my job had transferred me out there, and I met Jesus, and I was in this multi-ethnic church, and man, it blew my mind, the stuff I learned, and man, one individual said, I remember Mom Hill praying for me and praying over me, and I got healing in my body, and now here I am in Virginia or Chicago or Dallas or Houston or Africa, wherever it may be, representing Jesus. And it all started at Abundant Life. So if we believe that the Bible's teaching about the church is that the church is not brick and mortar, it's not a building, but it's a people living on mission then you need to understand abundant life is not just in Mountain View. We're in Virginia and Illinois and New York and Zimbabwe and the Philippines. And we are a church that has an Antioch anointing on our lives. And under my watch, I want to continue that legacy. I want to see God continue to do that. But what does it mean? There's three things about the church at Antioch that I am believing God for, that he would continue to press these things into our church. These things, some of them are shocking things. I I want you to look at the first thing. It's tucked away in verse 1, and it's really important, and it'll make maybe some of us a bit squeamish. Others of us will be highly encouraging, but I just want to just lay it before you and press into it. Look at what Luke says about the leadership at the church at Antioch. Verse 1, he says, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, and he begins with Barnabas. If you understand anything about lists of names in antiquity, especially in the New Testament, uh, whoever's name is mentioned first is the uh, most influential person in the list. When you read the list of the disciples, often it's Peter who's mentioned first, and Peter would prove to be the pillar of the church. Barnabas in this list is the leadoff batter. His name means son of encouragement. When everyone else was skeptical of Saul, later to be named Paul, Barnabas was the one who stood up for him and says, no, 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 this guy's good. And and it's because of that that Paul would later on take a prominent role in what God was doing in planting churches all over the place. Barnabas is a Jew. But next one, and you probably, if you grew up in the church, didn't learn this one on the flannel board. Next one is Simeon, who was called Niger. You know what Niger means? black. There's a black man in the Bible.
Bible leading God's people. Are you seeing it? You don't need to spend a day in seminary. What does Niger mean in the Greek? It means black. He's a brother. All right? Don't want to freak you out. So alongside of a Jew is a black man. Then there's Lucius. I mean, just the name Lucius. We know he's not Anglo. <laughs> Lucius, watch it now, of Cyrene. You know where Cyrene is? Modern-day Libya. Last I checked, I fell asleep in geography, but last I checked, Libya is in Africa. So he, too, is probably black. For sure, he's African. Next, there's Manan. Luke describes him as being a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Herod was king. Uh, tetrarch simply means the fourth part. Herod ruled the fourth part. The, the idea of a lifelong friend in the original language simply means that he was a foster brother of Herod. He was raised up alongside Herod, which means Manan is a person of incredible wealth and influence. And leading up the list is Saul, later to be renamed Paul, a Jew who persecuted the church of Jesus Christ and God saved him. Don't you see what's happening here? When you walked into the church at Antioch, your mouth hit the floor. This was not a place where there was an ethnic home team. This is not a black church. It wasn't a white church. It wasn't an Asian church. It, it, it wasn't a Pacific Islander church. It was a Jesus church. It was a multi-ethnic church where, where Jews and black men and Africans and wealthy and, and poor all got together under the banner of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It was a church, first of all, of Christ-exalting diversity. This is the norm when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ. At some point, I want you to read Acts chapter 16. Here's Paul, and he goes to plant a church in Philippi. Do you know who the first three members are of the church at Philippi? A wealthy woman named Lydia, a slave girl, and a Gentile jailer pastored by a Jewish man named Paul. The multi-ethnic church is not some 21st century phenomenon. It is our roots. So when you walked into these New Testament churches, the only place where you could see people of different ethnicities and different tax brackets loving each other under the banner of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the first century world was the church of Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, we're going to continue that legacy here. This is why I'm so indebted to Pastor Paul Shepherd because when he got here, the church is originally called um, uh, the, church, uh, the East Palo Alto Church of God. Pastor Paul Shepard's vision was that he didn't want to just be a church that just reached one town or one city. He wanted it to be a church that reached a whole region. And because of that, he began to ready the soil. He seemed more casual. He changed his preaching style. He, um, he changed locations. He made a whole lot of changes. And then all of a sudden, God sent the rain and blew on his efforts. And now folk just started showing up. And the church became not just diverse, but California diverse. Y'all got stuff here I ain't never heard of before. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And it's rich. And it's wonderful. And it's heaven. Now, some of you are sitting here going, well, Brian, why are you making a big deal out of this? I mean, um, uh, I, God doesn't see color. I don't see color. And you kind of subscribe to a colorblind ethic. And on one hand, I just want uh, I, I to encourage you. I think I understand your sentiment. When you say you're colorblind and you don't see color, you're not being literal because truly you, you're, you're seeing something right now, right? Uh, but, but what you're saying here is I, I, don't, I don't hold it against you. I'm not judging. I'm not excluding based on a person's color. That's what you mean by that. And I applaud the sentiment. But colorblindness is actually unbiblical. How do I know that? 
In Revelation chapter 5, John is exiled on the island of Patmos, and there on the island of Patmos, he looks up into heaven, and this is what he sees. Look at it with me. For you are slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The Greek word for people is ethnos, from which we get ethnicity. He says, I'm seeing people in heaven from every ethnicity. How do you know that on sight unless you see color? Color is not a fruit of the fall. God doesn't go, okay, sin entered the world, Brian, you're black. (laughs) See, our culture and world has done such a number on our psyche. The Bible says, Psalm 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's not just my spirit, that's not just my soul, that's also my ethnicity. God has created me redemptively black. No, I don't, I don't elevate my blackness am- above my Jesusness. I'm, I'm a follower of Christ first, but I don't eradicate my ethnicity either. I'm redemptively black. You're redemptively white. You're redemptively Korean. You're redemptively Pacific Islander. It's how God's made you. So we need to move from colorblindness to celebration. If you read Exodus, who does Moses marry? He marries a Cushite. You know where Cush is? Ethiopia. His wife probably used a hot comb. (laughs) Moses' sister and brother, they got a problem with it. They speak against it. They have a problem with his interracial relationship. That's right, Charlton Heston married a black woman. Hear me. (laughs) Three of you got that. So his brother and sister have a problem with it, and God goes, oh, you got a problem with it. Let me strike you with leprosy. See, racism is not funny to God. And it's ironic that he strikes strikes him with leprosy. It's as if he's saying, oh, you like being white? I'll make you white, white. Or hear what Solomon's wife says in the Song of Solomon. This is Solomon's wife, King Solomon's wife. Look at it with me. She says, I am very dark. Not just dark. I am very dark, but lovely. Dark and lovely would make an interesting product. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem. (laughs) Like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Our ethnic differences aren't a fruit of the fall. It's what it means to be made in the Imago Day, And what the enemy wants to use to divide us with, we need to come back with the power of the Spirit of God and redeem it for the glory of God. So here's what I'm saying. What the Church of Antioch shows us is that where the gospel is intentionally preached and proclaimed in communities that are conducive to it, diversity happens. Where the gospel is intentionally preached, proclaimed, and practiced in communities that are conducive to it, diversity happens. It's the fruit of the gospel. Sort of like if you took a jar of coins and in them are pennies and and quarters and nickels and dimes and you just scattered them over a table and you took a magnet and just kind of hovered over them. Well, it would collect uh, bronze-looking pennies and silver-looking quarters. There would be a diversity there because that's what magnets do. When When we take the magnet of the gospel in areas like the bay and we preach Jesus whosoever will let them come. They come. I want you to hear my heart. If ever there's a time we need churches that defy the status quo and you walk in and you see people of various ethnicities loving one another, worshiping one another, it's now. The hate-filled, divisive rhetoric that's coming out of our leader's mouth. The white nationalism and supremacy Our hope can't come from government. 
Government can change laws. They can't change hearts. But our hope must be come from a spirit-filled church that shakes its fist to the world and says, we will not go that way. We're going to go the way of Jesus. So we want to be a shocking church who continues to press into Christ's exalting diversity. But there's something else here. In verse 2, Luke tells us, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Notice with me, if you will, that the thrust of our text, the number one activity we see the church of Jesus Christ doing at Antioch, it's fasting, worshiping, and praying. They were a church that was obsessed vertically. They were consumed and concerned with the presence of God above all else. They were a spirit-filled church. The secret to their power wasn't in their administrative abilities. It wasn't in their charismatic leadership. It wasn't in their programming. It wasn't in their, off, uh, it wasn't in their incredible singing. The secret to the power of the church at Antioch was that when they gathered together, the Spirit of God filled them. And there was this tangible sense of something is happening here. The Spirit of God is being unleashed here. I feel him here. Several years ago, my wife and I were in London and, of course, you go to London, you got to go to Buckingham Palace, this, this great historic building. And this one day, there was just this palpable excitement there among the tourists who were gathered outside of uh, Buckingham Palace. I'm like, man, what in the world's going on? And they, uh, one of them pointed to the top of Buckingham Palace to me. And they go, you see that? I said, yeah, it's a flag. They go, well, it's not just a flag. Uh, this is the royal standard flag. It is the union flag. And when that flag is flown, it's to communicate that Her Highness... Her sovereign is in residence. Why were they excited? Because the presence of the queen was there. The queen's not there. It's just a cool historic building. But what changes the game is the presence of the queen. I want you to understand when we gather together, yeah, I, I want to preach the word to you and I, I, I want us to have great singing and great worship, but none of that matters unless the spirit of God is with us. We want to set an environment, an atmosphere where the spirit of God shows up. That's where the power is. That's when he shows up. Charles Spurgeon, that great 19th century um, pastor. He loved to give tours of his church, the Metropolitan Tabernacle. In fact, it was uh, over 14,000 people came to church. It's first modern day mega church. And so he'd give tours on Sunday. And as he's giving tours this one Sunday, he opens the door. Uh, they're downstairs and it's a room filled with hundreds of people praying. And Charles Spurgeon with a huge smile on his face says to the people he's giving the tour to, that's the secret to the power of this church. Friends, I want you to understand, we want to be a spirit-filled church, but how does that happen? Prayer is the umbilical cord that pumps the life of the Spirit of God into the wombs of our lives in our church. We won't experience this, friends, unless we are a, prayer, a people of prayer. I went to Brooklyn Tabernacle several years ago. I had been there uh, earlier on their Sunday morning worship experience. If, you've ever, if you ever get to New York area, I highly recommend going to Brooklyn and especially going to their midweek prayer service. I had flown there to go to this service, meet a couple buddies of mine uh, from a church I was serving at. We just had, we'd heard so much about it. We just had to see it. And we get there to New York City, and, man, it's raining cats and dogs uh, on this midweek evening. So my expectation when I got there is, I mean, you can kind of choose your seat and sit down, but when we showed up, thousands of people had already gathered. And we showed up right on time. We couldn't find a seat. Here they are in the middle of Brooklyn, busy Brooklyn, in the middle of the week, thousands of people coming together, praying and begging for the presence of God. Jim Cimbala says, if you want to know how I grew my church, I grew it not through preaching. I grew it not through singing. I grew it on our knees. We are people of prayer. Friends, I understand in the Bay Area we got a lot of stuff going on. We are incredibly busy. But I want to call us to be a people of prayer. 
In my own life, man, I just got to tell you, a couple years ago, I was sharing with you the other week, I just went through a very trying season. We all go through stuff in our lives, and man, there's just times in life where life will just kind of back you into a corner. And I just remember just feeling as if my soul had gained 500 pounds, that sense of heaviness. There's just this sense of, man, I just can't do this. I can't function on my own. I, I can't carry the weights and demands of my wife. And I got three teenage boys, and now they're starting to go off to college and a church, and people need to be ministered to. And, and I just, just got a whole lot going on. I just sense one morning the Spirit of God saying, when are you going to learn? You can't, but I can So, Brian, you've been functioning as if the letters behind your name is going to pull this off. (laughs) If you find yourself in a place in life where you go, I can't hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 11 when he says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I just, at that moment, I just, it was just one of those moments, just a handful of times in my life where I just sensed the Spirit of God speaking to me in very audible ways. He's saying, I need you to pray an hour a day. And I got to tell you, and I've been doing that faithfully since then, and hear me, that hasn't incubated me from problems. But the joy... Now there's a phrase in, in, in Isaiah 9, when Jesus, it says of Jesus that the government will be on his shoulders. So here's what I tell God. When I'm weighted down in life, I say, God, this isn't my problem. I'm actually going to roll this off of my shoulders and put it on yours. I can't, but you can. Friends, do you realize in the history of America there's been no documented revival in the Bay Area? What if God is saying to abundant life, I'm waiting to unleash corporate revival in the bay. But that won't happen until you come together and ask me for it. How's your prayer life? What does that mean for us as a church? Not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This is not going to be a church that's just dominated on a charismatic personality or people's gifts. That's not going to get it done here in the Bay. We've got to be a people of prayer. If I could just say something to you completely in pastoral love, I say it to you, I say it to to myself. The spirit of busyness in the Bay Area, I think, is actually killing what God wants to get done here. And I know you've got a million things going on. And I know traffic is a monster. It's demonic out here. (laughs) But God bless Mother Hill. Since I've been here, we've made all kinds of pleas for people to gather together to pray. And at most, it's six, seven people. And it's the same people. I want to encourage us to be people of corporate prayer. So every Sunday when we gather together, yes, in the middle of service we pray. Why do we do that? Because God says my house should be called a house of prayer. After service, our elders are available for you to come and pray with them. Because James chapter 5 says, if any of you are sick, let them come to the elders and they'll anoint you with oil and pray over you. But I believe that can be any kind of sickness. That can be physical sickness, emotional sickness. You're going through something. That's available to you. But starting the first Sunday in October, we're also, we've been doing it uh, so far. Our team gathers together and we pray before service. We're actually going to move that out front. And at 9.30 on Sunday mornings, we're going to come together and we're going to seek God's face and we're just going to pray. I saw my friend Dave Lomas do this in, at, at Reality San Francisco. I preached for him some weeks back on Pride Weekend. Here he is, church in San Francisco. 
Pride Weekend, I'm walking through just the madness that goes with Pride Weekend. And there are about 3,000 millennials gathered together at a high school in San Francisco. And they kick it off with a prayer meeting where hundreds of people are gathered together seeking God's face. I said, Dave, tell me about this. He says, look, man, we're on enemy territory. We can't be cute. This is war. So let's be a praying church. Let's go home with this one. They're a church of Christ's exalting diversity. They're a spirit-filled church. But look what happens. In the middle of them praying and worshiping and fasting, the Spirit of God speaks. I wonder if we're not hearing God's Spirit because we're not positioned to hear His Spirit. Notice when He speaks. It, they, he only speaks after the people of God clear away the clutter and they seek him together corporately. And in the middle of all that, here's what he says. Listen, I need you to set aside Saul and Barnabas for the work in which I've called them to be, to do. They go back to praying and fasting. They lay hands on them. And then verse 3 tells us that they are sent off. They go off now, and here they are. They're ascending church. They take their best leaders and they lay hands on them and they get sent out. And if you just kind of track with Saul and Barnabas and you just read through the book of Acts, it's stunning now what happens. They go to various towns. Whenever they walk into a town, they're like, man, where's the synagogue? And they go in the synagogue and in boldness, they, they show Jesus Christ unfolding the scroll and Jews come to know Jesus. Then after that, in that same town, they're like, now, where do the Gentiles hang out? Because again, we want to plant multi-ethnic churches and they go up to Mars Hill and Paul points to the intellectual elite to an altar to an unknown God and he preaches Christ to Gentiles and now some Gentiles get saved. They do the same thing in, uh, in Ephesus. In fact, they cause, the, the Bible says, no little disturbance. The whole city is turned upside down because these individuals have been sent out armed with the Spirit of God and the gospel of God. The world is flipped on its head. They're being sent out. Hear me. If you get nothing else I say, I want you to hear me. The power of the church of Jesus Christ is not seen in its seeding capacity, but in its sending capacity. We want to be a church that blesses people and sends people out. And what does that mean for some of you? Some of that, what that means is you have a Barnabas and Saul anointing on your life. I believe as I'm speaking right now, I'm just confirming what you've been sensing. Some of you, God is literally calling you to quit your job in the marketplace and to maybe go to seminary and, and, and go into full-time vocational ministry. And you've been running from that and playing excuses. Well, how the bill's going to get paid? You know who you're talking to? You're talking to a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Such was the testimony of Steve Stenstrom. Some of you know Steve Stenstrom. He used to come to Abundant Life when he was playing quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. And while coming to this church, God was speaking to him about his future. You know what he's doing now? He leads a nonprofit ministry called uh, uh, Professional Athletes Outreach, PAO. I've spoken at these events. And Steve, God is using him to lead hundreds of athletes to faith in Jesus Christ and get discipled in their faith. I mean, here I am. Steve puts on these conferences. I just spoke at one not too long ago. And, and, and there are, I, I don't even want to name their names, but you would know them, quarterbacks and all these NFL athletes, hundreds of them are gathered. And, and me and Francis Chan have been baptized them, literally, and they've made professions of faith because a man who used to come to abundant life accepted God's call, and he's being sent out. <laughs> Think of John and Megan Easterhouse. They're doing amazing work on Stanford University's campus through AIA, Athletes in Action. They're seeing all these athletes come to faith in Jesus Christ. We're, we're part of their sending team, their sending church. They're being sent out. Let me just end with this. That's not the call for most of us, and thank God. Most of us, God is not going to call us to quit our job in the marketplace, but instead what he's calling us is to see our job in the marketplace as his mission field to faithfully walk and represent him. And you need to see yourself not as an employee, but as a missionary to Facebook, a missionary 
to Stanford Medical, a missionary to San Jose State University, a missionary as you teach in that high school, a missionary as you perform that surgery, a missionary as you're at home full time with your kids, a missionary as you're working that blue collar job. You're being sent out. See, as I told a bunch of NFL players not too long ago, you're not an NFL player who happens to be a Christian, you're a Christian who happens to play football. You're not a teacher who happens to be a Christian. You're a Christian who happens to be a teacher. You're not a a, a software engineer who happens to be a Christian. You're a Christian who happens to be a software engineer. And what we need in the Bay Area are not just people who just move here and and run on adrenaline for about three years and and do all these day trips to all these exciting places and bask in in the cool weather. Then all of a sudden when the housing thing beats them down, they go out for greener pastures in Nashville and Charlotte and Atlanta. We need people who have a missional mindset. That says, I'm here because I'm called. God's called me here, and I'm not going anywhere till he releases me. That's the need. And we want to be that kind of church. That's why I've asked Pastor Gary to work. Uh, we, uh, we, we did this series on faith and work through Daniel. And if you remember that series, we were interviewing people like Carlos and others about what do you do and how do you take Jesus with you in that. And the response to that has been so phenomenal. What I've asked Pastor Gary to do is we're going to now design affinity groups that get together in, in the various kind of spheres and industries. And, and, and we just want to get you guys together. And you just need encouragement because you just feel lonely sometimes. Am I the only Christian here? And you're not. Getting people together and just talk about what does it mean to represent Christ in tech? And what does it mean to represent Christ in the medical industry? What does it mean to represent Christ in the blue-collar world? And to see yourself as missionaries and to get that kind of encouragement. That's what we want to do. You want to equip and inspire. In the 19th century, the worst disease you could be diagnosed with was yellow fever. And it drove people nuts as they were trying to figure out what is the cause of yellow fever. Some people thought at first it was rodents. Other people thought for a while that it was, um, uh, it, it was poor sanitation stuff. And then they got to the root cause of it. The cause of yellow fever, what wiped out whole cities and whole communities? Little mosquitoes carrying a dangerous message who were willing to be killed who were bold in spreading it. Those little mosquitoes changed whole cities. That's what it means to be a Christian in the Bay. We carry a dangerous message that doesn't bring death, it brings life. It's the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we need people who consider themselves nothing who are willing to put it on the line and walk with Jesus Christ and to be people of prayer. Friends, I believe when we do that, we'll be a church that has an Antioch anointing where years from now people will tell you, let me just talk to you about when I was at Abundant Life in 2019, 2020, 2021, man, they were a praying church, a multi-ethnic church, and I just felt sent out, and I lived on mission, man. And yeah, it, it was tough, it was tight in the bay, and my apartment wasn't the best thing in the world, but man, the sense of joy and fulfillment I had because I was living outside of myself for a bigger agenda. That's what I signed up for. 